Okay, good afternoon to the representatives of the state of Peru, the alleged victims and the general audience. We will begin this hearing of case 13.641, peasant communities of Cajamarca and their leaders in Peru. I am joined by the second vice president, Margaret May McCauley and commissioner and rapporteur for indigenous peoples, um, Esmeralda Rosemena and commissioner Roberta Clark. I will now give the floor to the executive secretariat so that they will present the case. And before that, I would like to say that we will be taking the statements of Manuel Ramos Campos and also the statement of Francisco Cali Tsai. During this statement, the petitioner will have 10 minutes after the statement, then another 10 minutes for the state, and then the commission will have another 10 minutes to ask questions as well. And we will do the same thing with each statement. And after that, we will move on to the stage of the arguments of the party, of the parties. The petitioner will have 10 minutes, the state will have 10 minutes. There will be a reply for the petitioner for each minute, for five minutes, and then the state will have another five minutes. And afterwards, there will be another 10 minutes for questions from the commission. So after we've explained the schedule, you will see a timer on the screen. And now I will give the floor to Marisol Blanchard. Thank you, Mr. President. Hi, everyone. This case is related to the alleged responsibility of the Peruvian state for the lack of consultation and free prior and informed consent of various peasant communities, descendants of indigenous peoples regarding the installation and operation of a mega mining project. The criminalization of community leaders in their struggle to reclaim their territories is also alleged. On July 19th, 2018, the commission informed the parties of its decisions to join the admissibility review to the merits of the case. The purpose of this hearing is to further the parties' arguments on admissibility and merits and to receive information on the current st status of the case. A statement will also be received from the victims mentioned by the president. Thank you very much. And now let's move on with this hearing. We will receive the statement of Manuel Ramos Campos. He will testify about the alleged threats and violations and other acts of violence against him. So I would like to ask Mr. Ramos to please state his full name, his place of birth and the place where he lives. I would like to greet everyone. My name is Manuel Ramos Campos. I, uh, uh, I have uh, been in several positions in my uh, organization. I'm the representative of uh, the indigenous communities in Cajamarca, and I am was the beneficiary of a precautionary measure in 2011. We are descendants from the Chachapoyas, Joremarcas, and Aucanos indigenous communities, and I would like to greet everyone here. Thank you very much, Mr. Ramos. Now I will give the floor to the petitioner so that they can interview you for 10 minutes. And please uh, update the timer. Good morning. Commissioners. Vamos a... Good morning, Mr. Ramos Campos. 
first of all, we would like to ask uh, if you could explain the commissioners what are the um, communities and uh, peasant rondas. I'm sorry, her audio is a bit uh, difficult. The communities and peasant rondas are a form of collective organization of the indigenous peoples, descendants of the Chachapoyas, Casamarcas, Corimarcas, yeah, and Yaucas that existed before the state. In the region where I live, uh, it was one of the um, regions of the government of Suyo, where the Spanish asked us for two quarters of gold and one of silver not to kill our forefather Atahualpa. They, we gave them the gold, but they killed him anyway. And now they want the gold of our lagoons and they will want to kill us anyway. Peasant communities have the collective ownership of the land and our rondas are organized within indigenous uh, peasant communities and in um, ranches and populated centers where we don't have the uh, collective ownership of the land, but each family has its own plot of land. Right now, we, um, we have our own institutions, Minga, which is the collective work for the benefit of all, the construction of schools, medical centers, our systems to clean the water, the Pararaico, which is made up of the help of everyone who needs help for us to build a house. We also have the Andaruto, the Pediche, the Yusa Parada, and our most famous institution, the way we care for our safety by rounding with our rondas, our region, and making justice in our assemblies with everyone's participation. For example, our ronda service per shifts, we do that in groups. And we uh, go around during the night together. Bien. Okay. I'm sorry, her audio is breaking up. I'm sorry, we have a serious audio issue. There's a connectivity problem. We cannot hear your questions. Could you please check your microphone? Let's stop the timer for a second. No logramos escuchar las preguntas. We can't hear the questions. I apologize. I'll try to use my colleague's computer. Mr. Manuel, could you please tell us how will you be affected by this uh, Conga mega project? What do you know about that mega project? How can it affect you? The uh, Conga mega project, a mining project, will affect all of our water sources, superficial and underground water sources that are part of our water system that we depend on. It will affect us because it will dry up over 27 lagoons. But the mining company deceived us and said that in their environmental report that they will only affect four lagoons, which is a lie. They don't mention the over 27 lagoons that will be affected. It will affect our spring waters, our uh, systems for drinking water, hectares and hectares of land. They say they will affect five rivers, but they don't say they will also affect our Rio, our Araucan River and they will also affect our economic activities, our agriculture activities, our uh, cattle raising activities and tourism. And they will affect our lives because we will have to move somewhere else. It will also affect us culturally and spiritually because just like our, the blood running through our veins, 
is ours, our lagoons, our rivers, our spring waters. They are the blood of our mother earth. And just like a mother feeds her children, our mother earth feeds us all. It's not just a source of wealth that gives us our daily bread. It's also the source of our life, of our culture. It protects the memory of our ancestors and it receives the, our bodies when we die. So as ronderos, we need to protect it because it's the best heritage we can leave to our children and our grandchildren, earth, air, water, all unpolluted so that they can also live in harmony with our Pachamama, with our mother earth. Another question, Mr. Manuel, thank you so much for your testimony. The Peruvian state has, has it asked for your consent? Sorry, did it ask for your consent before granting the concession of the mega mining project in order to launch this mega mining project? The state never, ever did it consult with us. We never gave it our consent for them to grant these mining concessions in the most important water section in our region. We only learned about this mega mining project in 2011 when the company wanted to start doing the work, but we never learned that the state had granted these concessions. And when you learned, what did it, when did you learn about it? And what did you do? What did the communities and the peasant Ronda say? Well, when we found out, we met in permanent assemblies and we have rejected the project once and again to defend our spring waters, our lagoons, our rivers. We went to every authority at a local level, at a provincial, at a regional, at a national level. We went to the president. We went to the mining company, to the World Bank. We also went to lawmakers, to the ombudsperson's office. As you can see, we did everything we could. We did, we launched all sorts of communications. Then we started marching, protesting. We launched a big national march for water. And what was the response of the central government? The government always responded with violence to just impose the mega mining project. They declared the state of emergency. They even sent over 2000 military troops in 2011 to the three provinces. And as a consequence of that, the police killed four of our brothers and it felt as if they were murdering us. One of them was underage and they left over 200 people hurt, injured. One of them, Eme Campos, who will never be able to walk again. He has to lie in bed every day. We have been harassed and prosecuted. All the Rondero leaders, they even tried to leave us without representation because they tried to file suits against our representatives. And there is police all the time in our territories, our ancestral territories, in all of our ancestral paths leading to the lagoons. How many criminal proceedings have been opened against you and the main leaders of the communities? In my case, over 67 criminal proceedings, just because I'm trying to fight for my water, for our water. Ines Fernandez, Eduard Roark, they have over 100 reports each. Many leaders were convicted. Cesar Estrada, Nelson Cuevas, they were uh, convicted for 10 years 
among other leaders. They keep on criminalizing us. Even today, and another case, the first week of last year, actually in December, I was chosen as the president of the uh, peasant leaders, but I had to quit because after 15 days, I received a subpoena because I needed to um, pronounce a statement at the public prosecutor's office just because I joined a protest when I was a regional councilman. Thank you very much. It's been 10 minutes. We have an, um, actually, you went over 30 seconds. We will move that time um, up to the state. And now the state has this time to um, ask questions to Mr. Ramos Campos. Thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner. I would like to greet the commissioners and the representatives of the victims. Mr. Ramos, we would like to ask a couple of questions as part of the delegation of the Peruvian state. Do you feel you're a member of an, of an indigenous people, Mr. Ramos? Mr. Ramos, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks for your question. We feel indigenous peoples because we are the descendants of the populations that existed in Cajamarca before the creation of the state. What territory uh, is occupied by that uh, indigenous people? Well, you know, we have our peasant rondas and we are organized not only within the peasant communities, but also in um, different properties and populated centers. But the ones that will be affected by the mega mining company uh, project over 10 caserillos and four indigenous communities will be affected by this. How many people are part of the peasant rondas so that the um, commissioners can understand how many people we're talking about? How many people are part of these peasant rondas? The rondas are organized in 127 districts of the Cajamarca region in the 13 provinces. So we are all part of the rondas and the 210 villages or caserios. So does that mean that all 210 uh, caserios or villages are part of the rondas that defend their territory, also minors? No, not minors. All of us who are older than 18. So could you give us a percentage in El Tambo, where you were a rondero, how many men between 18 and 50 years old can be part of the rondas? I was, it's not that I was a rondero, I am a rondero, all of us. But you said you were men. And I understand that we're not, we're not talking about women or older men. In my case, it's over 200 ronderos. And the population of each uh, village depends on this. In the case of El Tambo, my populated center, we have over, over 19,000 inhabitants, according to the census. But out of those 19,000, 200 people are in the rondas? No, no. That's why I'm saying that it depends on the village. So it's a small percentage out of the, um, no. We defend our territories collectively. We all defend it. What ancestral population is your, is El Tambo descending from? You know that by the uh, Araucan River, the Yaucas were here. I am a descendant, a proud descendant of the Yaucas. And my province descends from the Coremaucas. 
and all of the population is part of the same indigenous people? Yes, of course. And how can we credit that these persons are part of this indigenous people? Well, that's the what, what's happening right now. They discriminate us because they say we are indigenous peoples. They see a different reality. We have our own institutions. We have our own justice, our Rondera justice, and you won't acknowledge it. You won't acknowledge our collective justice. I understand. And what's the difference between the El Tambo Center and the um, Pace and Ronda you were part of? No, there's no difference because this populated center, El Tambo, is made up of all the villages, the caserios. We have an organic structure. For example, we have the um, committee for the camp from the peasant Ronda, and we also have um, different local committees, and they are all part of our peasant Ronda. We are autonomous. We do not depend on anyone. One more question. There are only peasant rondas in Cajamarca? Of course, there could be other organizations, but the organization that we have in Cajamarca are the peasant rondas. And what happens in other departments of Peru? Do you know other peasant rondas? Of course, this includes 17 regions in our country. We have peasant rondas in those regions and that's why we are organized in that way. We have the committee of the peasant rondas, we have the district structure, the regional structure, and now we have the national structure that is the single center for peasant rondas. One question. Do you identify yourself like that in the census when you were a question? The census, in the census, questions are individual, not collective, but I individually, and I'm proud of it as a descendant of the Yaucas, I identify myself as an in indigenous person. And we lost him, I think. Since when your peasant Ronda represents El Tambo? Does it represent the whole Cajamarca district? I think that Manuel's picture is frozen. I will ask the question again. Do you cons the peasant ronda to which you belong represents El Tambo? Of course, it represents the whole population of the El Tambo area. But as I said, we have our head quarters in Cajamarca, and then we have the provincial, the department, and the national structure. And it represents the whole Cajamarca district, of course, because this is a collective organization. So you consider that the Ronda represents all these people across the province, uh, the whole district of Cajamarca, of course, the whole province. I will formulate my question. In your opposition to the Conga project, you are considering that the whole district is opposing the project. That is not only what my province feels in Cajamarca, but what's more, there was an environmental assessment and one of the provinces or one of the, the government did not include us in one of those studies. But my question was a different one. So you would say that the peasant Ronda of El Tambo uh, and what they feel is the same as the rest of the provinces. Yes, that's what we all feel. And I have one more question. 
how can you explain that in 2013, according to public documentation and websites, other Ronda leaders said before the Ministry of Energy and Mining that they supported the Conga project. So do you represent them or not? Do not forget that Yenacocha has operators everywhere. And even in my town, El Tambo, through their NGO, Congreando, they are giving away things. But my question is that other Ronda leaders who were chosen just like you, if they support the Conga project, no Ronda leader supports the Conga mining project, none of them. Only those leaders who support the mining leaders, those are with the Conga project. Please, the state, please do not interrupt um, Manuel Ramos. I ask in specific questions and I want specific answers. Please, the state should follow the instructions of the hearing. Once you ask the question, please wait for the answer. Mr. Ramos, you have the floor. What I was saying, and I would like to insist on this, that the state wants to deny our uh, nature of descendants from indigenous peoples. Uh, so I have a question. Why some Ronda leaders supported the Conga project? How can you say, what can you say that about that? That's fake. I totally disagree with that because all the organizations of Pes and Rondas in my province are against the Conga project because we had an experience in Guayayo. There are over 1,200 environmental issues and no person is supporting the... Sorry, we have... Uh, we are on time, you have no more time. You have compensated those 30 seconds and you have some additional seconds. So we will continue with the questioning by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. To start, I would like to ask the second vice president and commissioner, Margaret May Macaulay, if she wants to ask any questions. Um, thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, please excuse my mask. I, I have a sinus problem today. Um, so with my, um, and I need to be protected uh, in the environment. Um, Mr. Mr. Ramos, uh, thank you for your evidence. Um, could you, you say you had you have a large number of um, cases um, filed against you by the state of Peru. Um, what have you? How have you been defending yourself uh, in relation to these um, charges that they brought against you? And and for what crimes? Uh, so we can have some idea. What crimes have they alleged against you? Mr. Ramos, you can answer the question right now. Thank you, Commissioner. We have suffered a lot of risks. And we are accused in the legal proceedings of damage, of usurpation, of lesions, injuries, for going to defend our ancestral territories and our lagoons. Thank you. Uh, can I? I would like to ask, sorry, yeah, Commissioner I, I Margaret. Have, I haven't finished that just one. I just want to understand that you're saying because you're def defending your land rights and your rights as indigenous people, you, you, do, you take part in protests against the acts of the, the government for this Congress project. 
Is that why you have been criminalized? I, I just want to understand. I would like to know if you could translate into Spanish because I don't speak English, sorry. <laughs> I thought the translation was on. Sí, pues. Puede, por favor, comisionar, repetir uh, la pregunta. Yo voy a... Commissioner, can you repeat the question? I will try to translate it. No, I was can asking, you re-ask the question? Yeah, uh, Ms. Ramos, is it because you are defending your land rights as indigenous people and taking part in protests against the Congress project of the state? Is that why you have been criminalized with lots of cases? Señor Ramos, la pregunta de la comisionada. Mr. Ramos, the commissioner's question is whether the reason why you are being criminalized is because you defend your land rights and because you belong to an indigenous, indigenous community. Do you believe that that's a reason why you are being criminalized? Yes, we are criminalized because we defend our ancestral territories, lagoons, uh geysers we when we protest we are denounced or we are um reported by different officials thank you because of time restrictions now i would like to give the floor to commissioner esmeralda rosemena that is a rapporteur for indigenous peoples so she can ask any questions thank you chair of this hearing I would like to understand Mr. Manuel. And first of all, I would like to thank you for your statement and for your defense because you are you show a lot of strength. I would like to highlight that. You're saying that the mega mining project and you were talking about the facts the environmental assessment report is not correct according to you you say that it includes fake information false information for example the number of lagoons or lakes that would have been affected by the project so do you have information to support that? Do you have that information duly documented? Do, have you identified or documented the mistakes or the false information included in the environmental assessment report? Let's not forget that the environmental impact assessment and all the studies conducted by the mining company do not tell the truth because they have been conducted by specialists and experts, but for with the aim of this project becoming a reality. And all I have said is a reality. I live here. The waters that come from the Conga Lagoon, that is one of the most important water source in Cajamarca. There are other lagoons. They account for over 20 hectares of water. And what the study says that the water will be drained and that the water will be used for mining. They use the word drain. Any peasant who sometimes has no education, they don't know what drain means. So I'm saying this because I live in the area and we know what's happening. And the peasant rondas have a schedule to visit the lakes, the lagoons, depending on the circumstances. On March the 3rd, we inspected our lakes, our lagoons, and what did we find? Find that there are doors and gates and concrete blocks in order to prevent us from entering the area. And even the National Police of Peru is 
surveilling these areas. What we are seeing is that the national police, instead of being taking care of us, they are providing services to Yanacocha company. But for the precautionary measure that I requested to the Inter-American Commission, the police would have hit us, hit us. I have one more question. Chair, I have one more question. What to understand what Manuel Ramos have just said. The state and the institutions that are involved in this matter. I would like to know if you, the ronderos, the ronda leaders, have you had any conversation or and have you received any information about the steps that are being taken? And do you know why the police is acting this way? Is there any communication with the authorities of the state of Peru to understand why all this is happening? The state of Peru never has never recognized our rights as indigenous peoples. In spite of the fact that the rights of indigenous people, indigenous people should be uh, contemplated, in spite of the precautionary measure we have met in Lima, Cajamarca, to request protection. But so far, we have no news. Imagine, and we never have a space. The state has never met with us and has never apply what the Inter-American Convention says. Thank you. Commissioner Clark, do you have any questions? Yes, thank you very much and good afternoon, Senor Manuel Ramos. Um, I understand part of what the state is, is, is articulating is that you and your community are not entitled or, 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 or not to expect consultation and informed consent because you do not we are not defined as indigenous people. Can you um, explain for, to me uh, how you respond to that? Or, or on what basis do you understand the state, how the state defines who's an indigenous person and why you object to that definition, which excludes you and the others in your community? Is there Spanish interpretation? Sí, con gusto. Okay. Yes, the commissioner would like to know that the state is not conducting a prior consultation because they do not consider that you are not an indigenous people or that you do not belong to an indigenous people as other people. We, the commissioner would like to know how the state defines uh, uh, what an indigenous people is. The state never recognizes our right to a free prior and informed consultation. And this appears in several rulings and the state requires additional requirements to enforce the rights of indigenous peoples. But according to the state, they have their own guides and regulations. Those guides and regulations, they limit our rights. Um, I'm not asking the commission to review the rulings, but for the commission to monitor the violations to our rights, because we are being charged just for defending our ancestral territories. Thank you. We have run out of time. I'm not going to ask questions right now and we will continue with the hearing. And now I would like to give the floor to the expert, Francisco Cali Tsai, who is a special rapporteur of the United Nations for Indigenous Peoples. Please, rapporteur, indicate your name, your place of birth, and your place of residence. Good morning, Chair. My name is Francisco Cali Tsai. I'm from Guatemala, and I live in Guatemala. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor for 10 minutes 
so that the petitioners can question the expert. Please, let's restart the timer and I'd like to give the floor to the petitioners now. Okay, the sun is breaking up. Good morning. We cannot hear you. I think that the other computer was working better. Good morning, Special Rapporteur of the United Nations for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Indigenous Peoples, we would like to ask you one question. If international law has a definition of what an indigenous people is, do you know? Thank you for the question. There is no legal strict definition of an indigenous people in international law based on the consensus of states and indigenous peoples that no definition is necessary to protect their rights. Indigenous peoples per se have the right to self-identify themselves as indigenous peoples. The, uh, the Declaration of the UN for Indigenous Peoples and the American Declaration for Indigenous Peoples were adopted without a definition and they are based on self-identification. And this is a normal practice that if, according to which minorities are not defined. The best way to understand the term indigenous peoples is based in a report uh, of the United Nations from 1986, who was written by Ambassador Jose Martinez Cobo. According to him, indigenous communities, peoples and nations have a connection or a historical connection with the peoples before the invasion. They consider themselves different from other sectors of society that now prevail in their territories or in part of them. There are non-prevailing sectors of society and they are here to preserve and to transfer their ancestral territories and their identities to next generations. Mr. Rapporteur, is it then a requirement to um, keep all the time all these, um, to meet all those requirements for the state to recognize you as an indigenous people? Uh, the historic territory, uh, property, the language, the collective, do you have to maintain all these elements so the state will say you are an indigenous people? No, it's not an exhaustive, it's not an actual list that says whether you're indigenous or not. You, right now, it is only necessary to meet part of the description and that they self-identify as indigenous peoples. The, even the permanent forum uh, says in its Article 1.1 of agreement of the uh, International Labor Organization says that um, peoples, in indigenous peoples who consider themselves indigenous just because they descend from indigenous people or uh, inhabit the territory that was inhabited by an indigenous people are indigenous peoples, whatever their legal situation, they maintain all of their economic, political, and uh, social uh, structures and institutions. And there's another agreement that also says, um, sorry, this agreement also says that they don't have to meet all these requirements, but only part of them. I don't know if that answers the question of the petitioner. Thank you, Mr. Rapporteur. Is it a requirement for the peoples to have a specific form of organization to be recognized as an indigenous people by the state? Not necessarily, though indigenous peoples as 
um, the UN Declaration says in its Article 9 and the Article 8 of the American Declaration may be organized in communities, nations, or other organizations depending on their uh, have, uh, customs and traditions, and the states cannot discriminate them or um, deprive them of their right because of the way they have decided to organize themselves. I will say this again, per se, are indigenous peoples because they self-identify as, as indigenous peoples. And how would you define self-identification or the right to self-identification? Well, indigenous peoples are the ones who decide how they identify. Um, speaking of their story, of their belonging to an ancestral people, having a defined territory, organizing as their uh, forefathers did. I think that uh, Pace and Rondas still have ancestral elements like the Minca or Minga, which is a community organization of labor. Um, I think that's an essential element for the self-identification of indigenous peoples. And in the case of uh, the peasant communities, the, 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 the legal name is peasant campesinas, these rondas, do you think they could be subject to the uh, rights and the laws of indigenous peoples? Well, if we go to the legal matters of Peru, the constitution since 29, 1920, sorry, recognizes indigenous communities and in the agricultural reform of 1969, it changed this name to peasant communities, but that doesn't change their nature or their rights. These are um, matters of the Peruvian legislation. And of course the Peruvian legislation recognizes the legal uh, personality of indigenous peoples as a democratic form of organization. So I think this situation is quite clear because the Pesan Rondas are a form of organizing the indigenous peoples in Peru. Therefore, these, Pesa, these Rondas meet the requirements of Convention 169. So what would the rights uh, they are entitled to be? Well, all of the rights that are belong to indigenous peoples, territories, lands, natural resources, the right to an informed free prior consultation for their consent, and all the rights that the um, international legislation grants indigenous peoples. I think that any other elements that might be taken into account should not undermine those uh, rights that are acknowledged, that are recognized internationally by the Peruvian state. You were talking about uh, recognition. Can the state's recognition be an official requirement for the respect of uh, rights? Um, not necessarily, because the indigenous peoples are the ones who self-determine. I'm sorry. It is necessary, not for the application, but in order to apply international law to indigenous peoples. Uh, a language, a common property, direct descendancy, a different lifestyle, historic continuity, um, territorial connection. These are their rights. And that's why the state should recognize them. So the official recognition would be an obligation of the state or a condition for the application of rights. No, it's an obligation of the state. And that obligation gives the state, it's redundant, the obligation to respect those rights of the indigenous peoples. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you for respecting uh, the time allowance. Now for 10 minutes, the state can interrogate Mr. Kalitsai as well. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Mr. Kelly, we would like to ask you a couple of questions. Um, are all big uh, peasant rondas part of an indigenous people? Well, depending on uh, the Peruvian legislation, um, it gives it a, a category or not only to the rondas, but the peasant organizations, it grants them all the rights of indigenous people. So all peasant rondas are part of an indigenous people in Peru. It's historically, that has been the case in Peru. Some peasant rondas would be um, indigenous peoples and some others wouldn't. That's what I understood. No, I didn't say that. What I mean is that because of the history of Peru, in Peru, indigenous peoples were converted or transformed into peasant communities. And the state uh, called these rounds, these rondas, an organization that is part of the organization of indigenous peoples. So all peasant rondas are part of the indigenous peoples. Is there a difference then between the rondas and the peasant communities? Well, peasant rondas are a form of organization of the peasant communities. Can there be indigenous peoples or peasant communities without rondas? Yes, I suppose so. In the Amazonian region and other parts, I imagine that there are indigenous peoples without these rondas. And the peasant rondas, Mr. Kali, are considered descendants of only one indigenous peoples, uh, people? It's a form of organization that the state imposed on indigenous peoples when it converted them to peasant communities. So it's a form of organization, yes, but are they, they descendants of ancestral populations? Well, let's remember that the form of organization of indigenous peoples it's not static. So there might be changes throughout time, but in peasant rondas have historical forms of practicing their community identity. As I said, the Minka in Quechua language to do community work, that is a fundamental element of almost all the indigenous peoples in the Americas. Now, at some point you said that there could be peace and rondas in other parts of the territory. So they don't belong just to the indigenous peoples in that area. I think that that's a characteristic of um, most indigenous peoples in Peru not only in Cajamarca. And I think that the representative of the uh, Rondas made that clear in his statement. He talked about local Rondas, but also regional and national Rondas. That's why they have a federal representation. And as an expert, if there are spontaneously generated rondas in different kinds of communities. Um, these peoples have a cultural form of organizing the care of their property. Is that possible? Yes, it is possible. That is why they decided um, to organize as rondas. There are many other experiences in other parts of the country where they are not called rondas. I'm not talking about Peru, about other places where community work is a fundamental uh, element of the ancestral heritage of uh, the uh, peasant communities. You call it whatever you want, but it is a historical and cultural element of indigenous peoples. And what pre 
colonial uh, institutions do you recognize in Cajamarca? I haven't visited Cajamarca, but I have been um, studying it when, since I was a part of the uh, Committee Against Racial Discrimination, received many cases, uh, and also my rapporteurship has received many cases from there. So I cannot tell you exactly what's going on in Cajamarca, but I have read many, many documents about this. And the peasant rondas are a fundamental element of the formation of the Cajamarca indigenous peoples. And what are the populations that um, uh, don't need these to be called uh, rondas? It's not, it's, it's not about requirements. As I said, it's about self-identification. The only thing the state, the state has to do here is recognize that self-identification and that self-organization they have decided to use. So I think that they are the ones who need to determine the elements for their self-organization and self-identification. So if a group of people in a rural or an urban area get together and self-identify as an indigenous people, would that be enough for them to access the right to prior consultation? Well, it depends. If you're asking me that if in Lima, a group of citizens organize themselves and self-identify as indigenous peoples just to have a consultation, well, yeah, then in that case, you would need a thorough study about that organization. I think that you are trying to make me say, yes, any citizen can self-identify as indigenous. They have all their right to do that, but there's a fundamental uh, thing here. The community itself decides whether they are indigenous or not. No, no, I'm not trying to make you say anything. Uh, I just want to listen to your statement as a teacher, as a professor, as a rapporteur. But the consult my questions are about this issue. Um, is there historical evidence for the presence um, of, is there, any, is there any historical proof of, ra of rondas as something that existed before the colonization? As I said, it's a form of organization imposed by the Peruvian state on the indigenous peoples. The only link to the past is the self-identification as such as the people they are part of. And once again, community work. You will find community work in all the indigenous peoples in the Americas. One more question. Um, the Convention 169, doesn't it also include objective criteria for the recognition of indigenous peoples beyond self-identification? Well, I think, it's quite clear with regards to this situation. It's about the elements that the Martinez Cobo study uh, gave in a certain point in time, but this convention also says that it's these elements or part of these elements, not all of them for a community to self-identify as an indigenous people. So. There are some things that that cannot be applied automatically or mechanically, because as you know, the law is dynamic. And based on this base study, um, the declaration and the uh, convention evolved and took in the um, took in new elements with the participation of indigenous peoples to define who are indigenous peoples and who belong to them. So the study or the interpretation from the academic uh, sector needs to translate to the reality and recognize the anthropological and historical analysis to identify these indigenous peoples? Not necessarily, because then we would give the state the right to define who is indigenous and who isn't. And that 
right belongs to indigenous peoples and their communities. Mr. Rapporteur, one final question. Do you know when the um, peasant rondas started appearing? How can we consider it's an ancestral practice of territorial defense? Once again, I don't know if I'm being clear, but I will say this again. These peasant rondas were a type of organization imposed by the Peruvian state to the indigenous communities or peasant communities, which before that were indigenous communities. We need to carry out an anthropological and sociological study about how the indigenous peoples were uh, converted or renamed. After that, the state imposed the organization in these peasant rondas. It's a form of organization. So we're talking about the beginning of the 20th century when the state imposed these rondas. Thank you, Mr. Rapporteur. Thank you very much. Now we will uh, move on to um, the 10 minutes allotted to the commission for it to ask questions to the rapporteur. Commissioner uh, McCauley, second vice president, do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think I have two, um, hopefully short questions. <laughs> Thank you um, for your expert um, evidence um, up to now. So um, I can't, I, Mr. Ka, Senor Kali. Um, I, isn't, isn't it not a fact that because of the failure of states, including Peru, to recognize the peoples they met in the geographic area, which became Peru, that the indigenous peoples were forced to self-identify themselves as indigenous, and they called in other countries, first peoples, original peoples, and so on, in, and to make set of mechanisms for their protection as a community, a collective community of peoples. Isn't that the historical, in very short synopsis, reason for, for what has happened today? Commissioner, I think that you have explained this very clearly. I couldn't summarize things as you have done. This is a failure of many of the states of the American continent. And because of that, the rights of indigenous peoples are not being recognized in many cases. In other cases, those rights are recognized in the constitutions. But what uh, in practice tends to happen is that those rights are minimized or reduced. And that's why we have international human rights instruments that go beyond the constitutions and recognize these rights that the states have ratified these treaties and therefore they have duties regarding the compliance of these instruments. So that's a failure, a historical failure of the states of not recognizing indigenous peoples. And that's why that we have these problems. Um, so in your uh, expert opinion, um, are we to uh, understand that your expert view is that these peoples in Peru, the communities, are entitled and were entitled to free, prior, and informed consent before this mega Conga project was commenced by the state? Sí. Estoy convencido y estoy de acuerdo. Yes. I'm convinced and I fully agree with what you are saying. These communities had and have the right to be pre pre uh, previously consulted 
And that's why we need a reparation process regarding the violation to that right. And only in your expert opinion, the indigenous peoples themselves and not the state can identify them as indigenous peoples. That's así, what I understand. Sí, así es. Son los pueblos yes, indígenas. That's right. Indigenous I, peoples should self determine or should self identify themselves, and the state has a duty to recognize that. That's what I understood. Thank you. Su micrófono, eh, presidente, no You're on está... mute, chair. Thank you. Now I'd like to give the floor to Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena, Rapporteur for Indigenous People. Thank you, President. I have only one thing to say, and I would like to uh, hear this from Mr. Kali. And you explained this very precisely. And I would like to ratify that I understood you correctly. The state of Peru, at a historical moment, if, when they approve their constitution or when they amend their constitution, I don't know if it's, it was a historical event. I don't know if 1969, yes, that's right. What the state of Peru did was the following. All these people, these peasant rondas, the, all these peoples are peasant rondas and peasant rondas should be recognized as such by the state of Peru. But that transformation process um, allows the state of Peru to not recognize peasant rondas as indigenous peoples. They are using that. I cannot understand how the state of Peru, after that historical event in which they determined that everyone could be a peasant ronda, they decided to include everything there for in terms of the structure, the organization, and the management of that group of people that could be there. I think that we need to understand that right now. So we need to understand how Mr. Manuel, or why Mr. Manuel has explained why he self-determines or self-identifies himself as indigenous. And the same with the, happens with his community. Thank you, Commissioner. Sorry, Chair, but I will use a, an example of our countries. In 1873, in a municipality of the Department of San Marcos in the west part of Guatemala, a president issued a decree. She, he was ashamed of saying that he belong to that indigenous peoples. In our country, we call indigenous peoples Latinos. And he decided that that municipality was Ladino. He didn't want to use the term indigenous. And he didn't want to say that he, he wanted to say that he came from a Ladino people, but not from an indigenous people. The historical events in Peru are not exactly the same, but what Peru decided to do is uh, they use the term peasant because it was the economic meaning of the word. But that's doesn't mean that these peasants do not belong to an indigenous peoples. I think that that's a problem. They use the economic term, and that was the historical mistake of the state of Peru. That was a mistake at the time. I'm not saying that the state of Peru now is responsible, but it's a historical issue that we need to repair. And we need to recognize that peasant rondas are indigenous peoples, and that the ronda is a type of organization of indigenous peoples. 
Thank you. That's all on my side. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. Do you have any questions? Yes, I do. I'm not sure to whom I should pose the question, but I think it's clear um, from Senor Manuel as well as Senor Francisco that um, the, the peasant Rondas are considered to be indigenous people because they self-identify, they are so accepted by the community and they are from a defined territory. These I understand to be some of the elements of the definition. What, just for the clarity of the case, it would be helpful for me to understand on what basis does the state deny the peasant Rondas their indigenous people status? Is it just the term peasant Rondas? Perdón, comisionada, pero creo que voy Sorry, a... Sorry, commissioner. But I'm going to do something that I shouldn't do at this time. And this is not a problem of the state of Peru. It's a problem of all the states of the American continent and also in other continents. Um, Pesan Rondas are not recognized as indigenous peoples so as not to recognize their right and in order not to recognize their right to a free prior and informed consent. The goal is that. I understand. It's not a problem of Peru, it's a problem of the continent. Uh, okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Clark. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. We have no more time. I'm not going to ask questions, but I wanted to especially thank the expert and UN rapporteur for being here today with us in order to answer the questions and to clarify some of the ideas that are very important for us. Now we will continue with other part of the hearing that are the final statements of the parties. The petitioners will have 10 minutes to take the floor and then the state will have other 10 minutes and there will be some time for replies. Each party will have five minutes. And I now would like to give the floor for 10 minutes to the petitioners so they can make their own statements. We are here to hear. We are here to hear you, petitioners. I don't know who is going to take the floor. Again, I would like to ask you to share my screen. You told us 15 minutes. I don't know if that's going to be possible. It's 10 minutes, and then you will have five minutes or replies later. Please. Can you see my screen? Not yet. I will be sharing now we can see your screen although the presentation is not there commissioners in this hearing that it has to do with the case 13 401 of the peasant communities of peru including the cajamarca province sorry you are not seeing my screen, sorry. I think that you are not being able to see my presentation, sorry. Okay. I hope that you can see it now. I would like to say that I thank the commissioners this opportunity to present this case regarding peasant uh, communities and peasant rondas from the Cajamarca, Celendin, 
Agualgayog and Bambamarca provinces. The, here we have several peasant communities that are affected by the Conga project. In order to summarize, we are seeing that the company is talking about the biggest gold mining project of South America. That's what the company is saying. And the mega project is owned by Newmont Gold Corp, Corp Corporation from the United States. Then we have Grupo Buena Nueva, Aventura from Peru. And then we have Sumitomo Corporation from Japan that has 5% of the ownership. This project affects three provinces and is located in the Cajamarca region. The environmental assessment study that says that one of the lagoons that will be affected is the Mamacocha Lagoon that is located in Hualgayoc, in the district of Bambamarca, from where Manuel Ramos is from. I would like to show some of the issues detected by the environmental assessment study. The study says that the Cajamarca, Celendin, and provinces will be affected. But to be honest, the three provinces will be affected. It's a, co a copper, silver, and gold mining project. 19,000 tons will be mined every day. The project will last 19 years. And the sound is breaking up all the time. And the company is using water from this lagoon or lake, that is the Yanacocha Lagoon. The lake was like this, but after the intervention of the company, the lake will be like this. And that is the methodology that will be used for the Conga project, is an open air mining project. And as I said, they're going to drain the water system of the region. It will affect five mini basins. It will be connected to five rivers and it will affect small and big lakes and lagoons. Two lagoons will be used for copper and gold. There are other two lagoons that will be for deposits and there will be 700 water sources that will be used for human consumption, etc. Et this is according to the environmental assessment study. Since they are at the top of the basins, this will affect uh, downward the river. So we'll see that around these areas, we have peasant communities and peasant rondas that live there. Um, there is something that we should notice is that peasant communities have kept the collective property of land. The state recognized the collective property of land for some communities, but after the agrarian reform, the state did not recognize the collective property of land for some peasant communities. As Manuel says the peasant communities were allowed to keep their own institutions. This includes 26 mining concessions that are building up in the Conga project and that will affect over 14,000 hectares of land. There is only a small area that will be protected. Here, there are four and communities that are located. We don't have time to tell the history, but we are providing you with information about the history of these communities. Because when the Spanish arrived in this area of Cajamarca, this is the first area where the Spanish conquerors arrived. However, it's an area of cultural resistance up to now. In the colonial era, these were called Indian uh, territories and Indian people. And they went to go, they worked in the um, farms. And the law uh, recognized the land, uh, 
uh, did not recognize the land of these people. But then in the 20th century, the constitutions recognize indigenous con uh, communities. For example, we have the constitution from 93 uh, and the constitution of 69 that talks about them as peasant communities. And as this happened across the region, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, after the agrarian reforms, the agrarian community name was changed to peasant community. And in Cajamarca, we have, for example, the Yaucan people that they lost the property of land because it was the property was transferred to the farm and the farms have, have farm rondas and the indige indigenous peoples work as security officers for the farms, 15 days for the farm and 15 days for themselves. That was the concept of a ronda. So we see that the indigenous persons were at the service of the farms. And after the agrarian reform, the peasant, the indigenous communities were called peasant communities. And the farm rondas told, we are not at the service of the farms. We are the service of ourselves, indigenous peoples. But since we are no longer indigenous peoples, we are called peasant rondas, but these are the same indigenous peoples that lived in the area. And there you can see in this chart all the decrees that recognize these peasant communities. The first one is the Supreme Resolution from 1946 and the one from 1963 before the agrarian reform. In those resolutions, they were called um, indigenous communities. And now the Ministry of Agriculture says, since they are peasant, the indigenous rights cannot be applied. And that's part of the problem. There is a whole story about this. The Constitution says that they have the right to their freedom, to their identity, to their land and the law of peasant rondas that occur that exists thanks to the rondas and their fight it says that the rights recognized to indigenous peoples and the rights recognized to native and peasant communities are also applied to peasant rondas so we do have a law that says so unfortunately the ministry did not perform uh, this prior consultation. It did not consult with any uh, organization before granting the concession. I am sorry to interrupt, ma'am, can you hear me? Ma'am, can you hear me? Ma'am, it's time. I wanted to say that when all this problem occurred, when they imposed this mega project on the, on the land, the, since the Peruvian state, I, I am so sorry, ma'am, but I need you to wrap up. Please stop sharing your screen so we can move on with the hearing. Um, let's see if the technical team, yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Just to wrap up, I, I am sorry, ma'am. I'm sorry, ma'am, but you cannot do that. Ma'am, please, ma'am, uh, technical team, we cannot move on. I am sorry. Can I have two extra minutes? No, not at this time. Please, let's try to respect the rules of this hearing. We had already said the allotted time. Um, I will, uh, the team will let me know how long you, 
um, overused your time, so the state will have the same amount of extra time. And after that, we will adjust this in the replies, but let's please try to respect the format of the hearing so we can all understand your arguments. If you go over the allotted time, it's really difficult for us to understand the final time, the final, your final words. Now uh, I will hand over the floor to the state for 11 minutes and 30 seconds. Thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner. Commissioners, members of the Executive Secretariat of the Commission, legal representatives of the petitioners and alleged victims of this case. Good afternoon. First of all, we will uh, follow the time schedule of the Commission, but we must observe that on the note, the invitation we received, we were told that we would have 15 minutes and then another five minutes. So we will try to adjust to this 10 minutes and we will share some of the of our documents if we are not able to cover them. Today, the Peruvian state, uh, our delegation has 16 officials. They are, are representatives at this case. First of all, the Peruvian state is concerned because so far, there's no clarity on the amount of legal um, representatives, petitioners, and alleged victims. We understand that there are two legal representatives, um, the Institute of Law and Society and the coordinator, whom we haven't seen today. But because of the resolution from 2018, uh, the uh, commission sent a um, document that was very similar to another petition, number uh, 2564. You can see this on screen. And the um, case of Ms. Maxima Acuña was part of the original document. So there's a duplicity in the processes, a duplication. Also in the original presentation, uh, there's an accusation uh, about the affected rights of uh, peoples in different provinces. Nevertheless, in the posterior reads, the petitioners say that the alleged victims in the districts of Guarumachanga, San Juan, and Churumachuca are the ones um, who uh, are the victims. Also, our state observes that uh, the ACUNAR requested the commission to widen the allegations to the alleged victims of this case. Now, with regards to uh, this request for uh, widening of the um, facts and the alleged criminalization of those who have come to the inter-American state uh, system, we believe that the commission should assess its admissibility. And that is why the uh, representatives should show which elements of the internal um, jurisdiction were exhausted. We will probably uh, send more documentation to back this up, but the state wishes to especially mention the cases of attorney Raquel Irigoyen and also Ms. Sulma Villa. With regards to the attorney, we believe that what she has alleges in her uh, last documents, we believe that she refers to journalistic articles uh, in Peru that um, and issues that were already solved domestically in, in Peru's uh, legal system. So we believe that what she says should be assessed. Now, with regards to Sulma Villa and this case in particular, she uh, has been uh, sued because of her work as a defender, but apparently this person is no longer linked to the case. So. There's a sort of, there are several inaccuracies and there's no a difference between the proceedings. We heard that uh, that was a confusion today between the case and the precautionary measure. And that um, makes it more difficult for the state to understand who are the actual um, complainants or uh, petitionaries. And that might, uh, 
might block the state from uh, working on this case as it should. Good afternoon, everyone. We believe that the uh, internal or domestic remedies were not exhausted because an amparo action is not the correct remedy for this kind of uh, mechanisms. And since there was no exhaustion, uh, we would also like to say that the uh, rulings that the uh, petitioner says that uh, are part of the remedies that were exhausted, they are not uh, part of this particular case. And the 169th convention is of course very important and uh, favors prior consultation for indigenous peoples. But as we said, uh, the petitioners should exhaust all domestic remedies. The petitioners should have also used the uh, domestic mechanisms as indigenous peoples. So even though it is true that identification by the state is declarative and not constitutive of rights and that self-identification is a subjective criteria established on Convention 169, right now there are no elements to determine the presence of indigenous peoples in these uh, representatives. The state considers that the petitioners should have uh, presented a writ of amparo, which would have been effective so that they would be identified as a people that had to be consulted. Additionally, the Peruvian state believes that uh, the recognition of a collective as an indigenous people is not part of the um, of the rules of procedure of the commission. So we believe that there's no admissibility here since the domestic remedies were not exhausted. Now I will give the floor to a member of the office of the prosecutor. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, we believe that the true controversy is whether the communities and rondas that are located in the district where the Conga district would operate are part of indigenous communities. The Peruvian state um, repeats that the commission is not the corresponding place to determine if a community is part of an indigenous people. That analysis should be based on identification criteria that prove historic continuity and self-determination and not as the petitioners say uh, through, no, uh, through arguments with no technical backing. Peasant communities are recognized in Peru it's an institution, a rural institution, but not all peasant communities self-identify as um, native peoples or indigenous peoples. Now, uh, peasant communities can constitute peasant rondas, which are a different uh, form of social organization, but not all peasant community has a ronda. So not all of them are linked to indigenous peoples. So in the districts that were mentioned today, there, uh, there are no subjective or objective criteria met to um, identify these peoples as indigenous, since these rondas are not ancestral forms of organization. As the petitioners say on their website, and as was sustained by many specialists, the first one was created in 1976, by the population. We should also say that based on the census that the state held in 2017, only 0.17% of the population in La Encañada speak Quechua as their mother tongue. In Sorochuco, that percentage is that of 0.12%. Comparatively, in Lima, 16.30% of the population self-identify as Quechua. Now, for the state, it's very important for the commission to take into account that as the petitioners have said, up to the 1980s, the term indigenous community was used to describe any rural population. 
So the meaning of the term indigenous as it, as it's mentioned in our constitution is not what we understand because back then it would uh, refer to all kinds of rural inhabitants. And we will send more information uh, in the report we will send in 30, in 30 days. Okay. For these final minutes, we would like to say that the state has presented its arguments based on all aspects related to this particular case, even though we have paid attention to what was said by the witness and the expert, the dynamic of our of this exposition does not allow us to uh, respond to each of these aspects. But as the state usually um, does in our the report that we will send in the next 30 days, we will reply to uh, everything that was said. And that will be the end of this part of our presentation. Thank you very much. And now uh, we will move on to the final stage of this hearing. I please ask you to respect the uh, allotted time so uh, you can, um, so we can all speak. I would like to ask for technical support to um, stop the speaker after four minutes. Petitioners, you have the floor for four minutes. Thank you very much for your um, question, representatives of the state. I would like to show you why when the uh, rondas assessed whether they would present or file a writ of amparo, which is what should have happened, we found this assessment in the Peruvian state, even though the Congress, the Constitutional Congress ratified uh, Convention 169 in 1993, and Peru was subjected to it and the court, all the decisions, judicial decisions up to 2007 denied the right to prior consultation. Since 2009, we did find court decisions that recognize the right to prior consultation. So we said, okay, let's do that. But what's the problem? The case law, the jurisprudence in all the rulings of the Constitutional Court of Peru, which is the highest court in Peru, says that even though between 2009 and up to last year, even though there is a right to prior consultation, it is not to be understood that these consultations can prevent projects from being carried out. So why would we file an amparo that would delay us two, four, six years, which, which happened in some cases, if the state is gonna say, well, there was no consultation, but you don't have the right to object. You don't have the right from refraining, to refrain from giving your consent. And this is what we're discussing here. The right of the peoples, as the Inter-American Court said in Saramaca versus Suriname, the rights of the peoples to uh, give their consent or refrain from giving it in case of uh, impactful projects, as this one. This is ruling 22-2009, the first one that says that there is a right to prior consultation, but that does not grant it the capacity to uh, stop, to halt a project. All the other rulings say the same thing. And there is something that the Peruvian's representatives did not say. This In December last year, and the same thing happened this year, the constitutional court went back on its word, on its decisions, because they say that the, the right to consultation does not include consent. And they actually say that the constitutional court cannot protect the right to prior consultation because it's not a constitutional right. They said so 
in the El Pastaza case, which will come to the commission with their case. So the, they have closed the path the cons uh, to the constitutional court, and not only for prior consultations and consent, but also for the defense of defenders. My case in particular, because I came to the commission, they said that it was disloyal. They said that this does not affect honor and the criminalization cases that uh, reached the court were not um, accepted either. So the peoples have found a closed door in the court. That is why we came to the commission and we request the um, court to, sorry, the commission to issue its report so this can be sent or can move, move on to the Inter-American Court. Thank you. Now we will listen to the state for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. We will be brief as well. We, um, we will send the rest of um, our arguments in written form. We have heard the representatives. The representative, she said that why would we go to the constitutional court if there's case law against us? Well, as we mentioned in this case, there are two moments uh, that we believe we believe uh, how the exception should be uh, shown in this case. First of all, there is no um, nothing saying in the document about the nothing says that there was an exhaustion of the domestic remedies as an indigenous people. They have not explained that either about how they exhausted the remedies. The Peruvian state says that there is an amparo, a constitutional amparo that could have covered that requirement. And they focus on prior cons consultation. And as we have mentioned, we haven't reached that moment yet because we have not exhausted the domestic remedies on the first part that enables them as an indigenous people. Regardless of what the um, speaker said today, but we haven't exhausted domestic remedies. The, so that is why the state claims they intend to expand this case and link it to a national process fostered by her against another private person. We understand that there are several claims here, but we understand that there's no relation to the facts of this case and that um, the inter-American system should not be used here. That is the position of the Peruvian state, and we will elaborate on this on a written report. Now I will give the floor to, uh, prosec to the prosecutor so he can wrap up our presentation. Thank you, Carlos. I would just like to say that uh, the holders of the right to uh, prior consultation are originary or native peoples, and not all the rondas meet these requirements. I think that they are forcing the figure and they are trying to equal the rights of indigenous peoples to those of peasant rondas, where we have seen that they are not the same. Now, there is a specific office in the state about these particular issues, and based on census and self-identification, there's no evidence of objective or subjective criteria that say that the Cajamarca, about the Cajamarca peoples. And that is why when these uh, facts occurred in 2011, there was no evidence of uh, indigenous peoples inhabiting in the Conga region. And that is the case right now. There's no enough information to determine that these populations are indigenous peoples. In accordance to the um, criteria of uh, Convention 169, and 
there wasn't a state obligation in 2011 to carry out a prior consultation. We didn't have this information back then, and that is why the Peruvian state believes that the commission is not the place to provide this recognition. And we would like to request the commission to close this case. And finally, the project is not active. It has been inactive for 10 minutes. So what threat are they talking about? When uh, the project has had no activity in the past 10 years, this should be assessed by the commission in its uh, possible merits report. Thank you. Time is up. Um, so before wrapping up this hearing, I would like to thank the delegation of the Honorable State of Peru, uh, the uh, rapporteur, our witness. It's been a pleasure to speak to you all. And both parties can present their written observations. They will have up to 30 days after this hearing. So we will now close this hearing. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Gracias. 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 Gracias.